A few announcements to share. The first, we want to give a huge welcome to our guest uh, preacher, uh, Reverend Amelia Castillo. She is the pastor at Trinity Skipac, and so we welcome her this evening. We have a second guest with us tonight. Normally, we have our choir director and organist, Tony Gorici, on organ, but he is currently sick with COVID. And so we ask prayers tonight for our, our music minister, Tony, but we welcome our substitute organist, Pat Keen. Uh, this is our second Lent service. Our theme this year is The Other Side. And no, we're not talking about the other side of the pearly gates. We're talking about getting to the other side of trials and tribulations. Passing through trials with God as our guide. And so that is the theme throughout this Lenten journey. Additionally, we continue to collect a mission offering throughout these Lenten services. This year, we are collecting for cradles to crayons. They serve the multi-county area, providing for the needs of children from birth through uh, school age. And so we ask that you uh, discern what you can give and place your offerings in the offering plate as you either enter or exit this evening. Finally, we do have a time of fellowship ready after worship, so I invite you to stay and enjoy some goodies and some hospitality. With no other announcements to share, let's be in the spirit of worship together. To our world filled with brokenness and disease, God brings you. To our world and disappointment. God, God brings joy. To our world filled with anxiety and fear, God, God brings peace that has his understanding. People of God, shout with joy and thanksgiving. Let us worship God with gladness. For God is good, and God's love endures forever. God's faithfulness continues through all generations. Now, at this time, let's rise either in spirit or body if you are able, and together sing.
Jesus. Bless us in our worship, our praying, singing, and giving, that we might honor you and one another. Amen. Lent is a time of darkness where we reflect on the ways that we have sinned, on the ways that we fall short each day, and the ways that we have separated ourselves from God. Join me now as together we confess. God of grace, we confess that we rebel against you and your will for a just and inclusive world. Like Jonah, we often prefer that you silence or even punish those we dislike. We are guilty of rejecting your mission of mercy for others and ourselves. We ask forgiveness for all false judgments, unkind thoughts toward our neighbors, and for our prejudice and contempt for those who are different from us. We ask pardon for ignoring human need and suffering, and for our indifference to injustice and cruelty. We thank you for this lesson opportunity of repentance, revival, and renewal. Amen. Siblings in Christ, the good news is that there is nothing, not height, death, ruler, things present, or things to come that can keep us from the love of God. In the name of Christ Jesus, our sins are forgiven.
the, na the nation that had conquered Israel just decades earlier. The people of Israel, Jonah's people, hated the people of Nineveh. Jonah did not want to prophesize to the enemies of his people. He didn't want them to repent of their ways. Jonah was comfortable with God destroying his enemies. So Jonah ran the other way. He hopped into a ship and tried to flee to Tarshish. And uh, if you look on the map, Tarshish was a western seaport in Spain, and it was as far west as you could possibly go at that time. That was It was the farthest west place the people of Israel knew about. And that's where Jonah tried to go. Jonah went west instead of east to Nineveh. I don't know which direction is which from your pulpit, but you know, he went the total opposite way. <laughs> and he went the opposite direction God commanded him to go. And we read through the scripture, as we read through the Bible, we know that God doesn't like it when we don't follow God's commandments. This makes God unhappy. And God really doesn't like it when his own prophets do not follow God's commandments. So, God made a terrible storm on the sea. Everyone on the ship, people from different nations, people with different beliefs, they all prayed to their gods and tried to get their gods to calm the storm. They dumped the cargo into the sea. They threw the cargo off the ship. But Jonah, oddly, had tucked himself down into the hold of the ship and was sleeping through the storm. He was fast asleep. Finally, the captain of the ship came down, woke up Jonah, and demanded that Jonah also start praying to his God. The sailors then, that didn't work, the sailors cast lots, and Jonah got the short stick. And everyone on the boat realized the storm had something to do with Jonah. Jonah fessed up. He told the men on the ship to throw him into the sea, which they were reluctant to do because they were good people and you don't just throw people into the sea. But when they finally did what Jonah said and tossed Jonah into the sea, the storm was instantly calm. But we know his stories tell us this. God wasn't done with Jonah. God had a large fish swallow him up. I don't know if the fish was teal with hot pink lips, but maybe. And while Jonah was in the belly of the ship of the fish, he prayed for three days. And after those three days of prayer and contrition, God had the fish spit Jonah up on dry land. And then another word from God came to Jonah. Jonah was told to now go to Nineveh and proclaim God's message. And Jonah thought, okay, I'm not going to keep running away. Jonah walked to Nineveh, a very far journey. He walked to the city, and he walked around the city and within the city and told everyone that God was going to destroy their city in 40 days. Strangely, the people of Nineveh listened to Jonah, a prophet of our God, not a prophet of their gods. They fasted, and everyone clothed themselves in sackcloth, a scratchy fabric made of goat hair, as a sign of contrition and repentance. And as we read in our scripture, even the king of Nineveh followed suit. He climbed down onto his throne, he covered himself in sackcloth, and he sat in a pile of ashes. God was so impressed with the turnaround of the people of Nineveh, God decided to spare the city. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, God relented and not, did not bring on them the destruction God had threatened. All of Jonah's hard work, his long journey, his preaching and warnings, after all of this, you would think Jonah would be pleased with his success. I mean, when prophets preach a message, and everyone changes and does what the prophets say, you would think, oh great, like, I did it, they listened to me. But no, Jonah became mad at God for not destroying the city and killing the people of Nineveh. Jonah still considered those people his sworn enemies. Despite watching and living among them for 40 days, 
Jonah felt no compassion for them. And then God and Jonah had a weird conversation where God basically called out Jonah for being petty. And God reminded Jonah that God's prerogative is to redeem the people of the world, even when those people don't understand, believe in, or worship our God. God's prerogative is always to redeem people, no matter what. No matter if they believe in the wrong thing, no matter if they look the wrong way, no matter if they break all the rules, God is our, our God is a God of love and redemption. And Jonah had trouble with that. As Pastor Leslie mentioned earlier, this year our pastors decided we would focus on how Jesus carries us to the other side. Jesus carried us through the pandemic. Jesus carries us through the difficult times in our lives. And in the Jonah story, we are reminded that Jesus carries us through situations even when we're wrong. Situations when we are the people that need to change our minds. Jonah thought he knew all about those people in Nineveh. Those people were his sworn enemies. They practiced the wrong religion. They were the wrong ethnicity. They were just evil. Jonah was happy God was going to kill them. Pretty sick. Jonah was happy the 120,000 people who lived in Nineveh, men, women, children, babies, grannies, Jonah was happy they were all going to die. They would be wiped off the face of the earth. Jonah was not interested in helping them, in warning them. And even though Jonah was a very faithful man, so faithful he was one of God's prophets, when God commanded Jonah to do something Jonah disagreed with, Jonah tried to disobey God. Jonah wanted his enemies to be destroyed. And when God forgave them, the enemies, instead of appreciation for how merciful and gracious our God is, Jonah instead became angry at God because Jonah's priorities were all wrong. Jesus carried Jonah through his change of heart, his change of mind. The book of Jonah ends abruptly. People complain about this. Biblical scholars complain about this. Like, there's not a, an epilogue. There's no follow-up. We don't know exactly what happens. We don't know if Jonah fully got it. But I believe this story is included in our scripture because he did and I believe Jonah's story is included in our scriptures as a reminder for all of us that God uses unfaithful, broken people to do God's work. Our scriptures are full of people who were used by God despite their failures, people who changed their hearts and minds. God uses, over and over again, God uses wounded, messed up people to do great things. We know this. We read this in our scripture. David was an adulterer and murderer. Abraham was a liar. Paul persecuted Christians. The Samaritan woman at the well with a checkered past ended up evangelizing and converting her whole city to the Christian faith. And Rahab the prostitute saved the lives of those three Hebrew spies who came to Jericho and ended up saving the Hebrew people. God uses people who are unfaithful, who are liars, who are murderers, and who are broken to do work on God's behalf over and over and over again. And like those people in the scripture, we are those people in real life. We all have made poor choices in our lives. We all have failed. We all have said hurtful words and done hurtful things. We all have trouble forgiving. We all struggle not to hold grudges, and we are all prejudiced against people who don't look like us, or live like us, or worship like us, or talk like us. We struggle to follow God. We run away from God. In many ways, at various times in our life, we are just like Jonah was. And yet God uses us, the broken and perfect people that we are, to do God's work in this world. God loves us in our imperfection. God invites disobedient and unfaithful people to do great things for God, to do great things on God's behalf. 
God supports us and carries us through the rough and difficult patches in our lives, and then calls on us to do God's work in the world. To love other people, to share the good news, to wipe the brows of people who are suffering, to visit people in prison, to care for vulnerable and hurting people, to feed the hungry, to lift up the downtrodden. God uses us, even though we are broken and even though we make mistakes, to do God's work in the world. God loves us despite our imperfection. God loves us even though we mess up all of the time. And this is the good news, that God loves us, that God forgives us, that God's love is redemptive, that God uses us even though we're imperfect to do great things. And God's mercy to us extends from this world to the next. Jesus carries us to the other side, and then God calls us to serve on God's behalf. So my friends, may we do so every day with love and grace in our hearts and in our attitudes. May it be so.
as a larger community of faith. We're grateful for the air in our lungs, the blood in our veins, and the wonderful food that we will share. And oh God, it is out of our gratitude that we give back. Humbly accept, we pray, our offerings and transform our paper bills and metal coins into mission and ministry. This night we pray for all who are sick, all who are dealing with chronic pain, all who have tests or treatments coming up. In particular, we pray for our organist, Tony. But we also pray for those who are in need of healing in spirit and in mind. God, we name to you those dealing with memory loss and dementia, those struggling with mental illness, depression or anxiety, and all who fight the demons of eating disorders, addiction, and thoughts of suicide. Gracious God, we continue to pray for those who are in the midst of natural disasters, for the tens of thousands dead in Syria and Turkey, as well as the survivors who are now in need of housing and food. We pray for those on the West Coast who have been devastated by a winter storm. We ask your presence uh, with all of those who are in need. God, we ask for peace in this world tonight. May the peace begin in our own hearts, that it may flow into our homes, and from our homes into our churches, and from our churches into our community, until this entire world is held in your loving embrace. In particular, we pray for Ukraine. We pray for our schools and street corners, and everywhere where angry guns preach a gospel full of peace. Are there other prayer requests to lift up this night? <laughs> yes. Uh, my friend Sam, her son Maddox will be two in June. He was born with a brain defect um, and had brain surgery this past week. All right. We pray for little Maddox who just had brain surgery. Are there other prayer requests? Yeah. We pray for the hungry of the world. Tonight we lift up and pray for those who hunger. In particular, all of those in our nation who, as of today, lost some of their food assistance. Okay. Any others? Seeing none, let's pray the words that Christ taught us to say together. Our Father, who are in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us rise in spirit or body one last time as together we sing that God has spoken by the prophets.
Amen.